Now, how many of you out there are going to plant some switchgrass this year? Uh, maybe you already frost seeded. You know, a good frost seeding time uh, for the upper Midwest is any time after October 1st, even Labor Day if you're up north even further. So a lot of switchgrass is in the, in the ground and really because of reason number five down here, <clears throat> let alone some of these other minor reasons, a lot of switchgrass plantings are going to fail and they're just beginning right now. So we'll talk about those failures and I wanna see you succeed. Switchgrass actually is a seed that grows just about anywhere. Don't need much fertilizer. Um, if any at all. Uh, it can grow in pHs as low as uh, low fives. So it really works well on soil that's eroding away. It holds soil, combats erosion. It'll grow in a lot of different environments, but there's really one huge reason it fails. We'll go over there at that at the end. Number one, adding switchgrass to other grasses. When you have mixes containing big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, everyone's always looking for that great you know, next proprietary blend. And really, if you're looking for something standing up and something that helps sustain wildlife throughout the wintertime, it has to be actually standing. It can't be lying on the ground. And when you add those other grasses to a mix, especially in the upper Midwest, uh, northern third of the country, a lot of that grass is gonna fail. It's gonna lie down. It's not providing cover. And so because switchgrass is added to other grass, a lot of those uh, seedings are failing before they even begin just because they're not going to provide the cover needed in the winter months and that's when it's needed. Also, switchgrass cannot stand any competition. So when you have taller grasses within that mix, they shade out the switch, kill the switch, and two to three years later there's no switch in the mix because it was shaded out and died. I've seen that time and time again. I've seen many, many native grass uh, plantings and CRP plantings fail because they didn't have enough switchgrass in the mix or they were not solid switch. And everyone will talk about the pollinator blends. I love pollinator blends. I'm actually planting some on our, our uh, Minnesota property this year, um, but I'm doing it adjacent to heavy switch. And a pollinator blend is great. People say, oh, we're gonna help birds, butterflies, bees, the white tails will love it, pheasants will love it, rabbits. Well, they sure do love it during the summer and during the early spring, during the early fall. They love it for a few months, but when it all dies back and there's no cover, they don't love it anymore. In fact, they can't live anymore unless you provide adjacent quality cover, and that's where the strips of switchgrass come in. You don't want to mix switch most of the time with any other variety of grass, forbs, forages, flowers, because it's not going to provide the cover that you need to provide sustainable wildlife protection during the cold uh, season. Not thick enough. And this goes back to, it used to be kind of some of the thought that was taught out there and this is wrong, but let's plant switch at five to six pounds per acre because then that'll be open enough to, for deer to bed in that mix. Well folks, deer don't want to bed in switch no matter if it's thick switch, light switch, there's no food. You have to have browse in there to support daytime bedding even nighttime bedding. They're not gonna bed out in that switch. They need to have some type of browse around them. A lot of times switch is too thick, depending on where you're at, for deer to actually bed in. Now if it's a big winter storm, uh, blizzard coming through, maybe even a giant thunderstorm, deer might burrow in there and try to get that thermal protection when it's cold. But outside of that, it has to be thick. It has to stand up. I encourage most of the time we're using switch for screening. We're using it as a base form of cover to actually screen off and protect the areas within where deer would browse and deer would live. They love the edge of switch, not in switch. And so I'd recommend eight to 10 pounds per acre, not five to six. Eight to 10 pounds per acre because most of the time what switch is used for are screening, screening lines, or complementary thick cover for wildlife, small game species, adjacent to pollinator blends, early successional growth, browse and so there's a difference between the two and you don't want to mix those two together or it's not going to be thick enough uh, number three be very wary right now there's a lot of cheap switchgrass seed on the market it's cheap for a reason a lot of it's self-harvested a lot of times they're including a lot of weed seeds in there bad germination rates and john comp northwoods whitetail seeds that's where i get all of my seeds from his switchgrass, he refuses switchgrass shipments every year, multiple shipments, because the germ rates are low and there's just a lot of garbage in the seed. He'll just send it back. He might have 20 
purchasers waiting for their seed and he just will not sell bad seed. If you're finding seed out there for six, seven dollars a pound, it's probably bad seed. A general range I would believe is more like 10 to 12, somewhere around there, 13, 11, whatever it is. But when you're finding seed for half that, there's, there's a reason to be very wary. Uh, we have foxtail on a property right now where we didn't see foxtail before and it was right in that switchgrass planting and i believe that those weed seeds foxtail is common to be harvested along with that switchgrass have it in the mix and that's just one weed seed that can transfer into your plots into your plantings onto your property that wasn't there before because of the cheap switch with low germination rates and you look at it, it's just a game of uh, percentages so if you're buying something and you're paying high dollar for it, it has a high germ rate, germination rate, then you're going to be rewarded with a very thick stand of whatever you plant, where you're going to have to almost put it on thicker if you buy that cheap seed because you're going to have a lower germination rate. So really just look at that. Cheaper isn't always better when it comes to any kind of seed blend, but especially switchgrass. And in the majority of switchgrass that's grown around here over to south of the Twin Cities, down to southern Iowa, over to New York, Pennsylvania, and north is cave and rock switchgrass. It's very common. You can find it everywhere. And again, if you're finding it a lot cheaper one place than another, be very wary. Number four, learn from my mistakes. This is, uh, this is a pretty big one here. Uh, mix with screening. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Let's say it was 2015, 16, somewhere around there. Mixing switchgrass with Egyptian wheat or screening of some kind. What I even did with that is I established the switchgrass through frost seeding using chemicals It came in well. And, and then it got to a height in July, let's say seven, eight inches, somewhere in that range. And then I broadcast Egyptian wheat on the ground, which will grow pretty well when you have a rain coming. And it did. And uh, it was looking pretty good end of July, August, September. It's, it's very, very deceiving because you had a great stand of switchgrass you could see and then you had the Egyptian wheat but pretty soon disaster struck and disaster meaning that the Egyptian wheat eventually shaded out the switchgrass and I had switchgrass in that first one foot to two foot layer facing the sun on the south side and the remaining 10, 12, 15 feet deep had zero switch in because it wilted and died. Folks, be very wary. There's some pretty bad advice out there for mixing switchgrass with various forms of screening, look at it this way. If it's thick enough for the screening to be a viable screening, Egyptian wheat, John Cop, Northwoods Whitetail HD screening, if it's thick enough for that screening to be viable and screen you when you're hunting and screen deer from deer and you can't see through it, then it's going to shade out and kill the switchgrass. At the same time, if it's thin enough that the switchgrass is allowed to live, that means it's so thin that it's not going to be pro provide any screening in October, November, December when you need it the most. You can't go by August and September. You have to go by what that screening looks in, like in October, November. And again, if it's thick enough screening to actually provide screening in October, November, December, then it's going to shade out and kill the switchgrass. Just go from my mistakes and learn from me what I learned six, seven years ago. And at the same time, if it's a light enough screening that allows the switchgrass to live, then you're not going to have any screening at all in October, November, December. The switchgrass will be established. You should have just went with straight switchgrass to begin with. That's, you know, a mistake that I made. And I, and I will add another mistake that's not in here, but uh, 2,4-D is a broadleaf killer. Unfortunately, with most of us who are food plotters and we're using ATVs and sprayers, this isn't an exact science. So it's very easy to put too much 2,4-D on switchgrass. Let's say it's young, it's easy to kill it. If it's old, it's easy to injure it. I've done both of those. So I just avoid using 2,4-D in general. If someone's recommending that, be very, very wary. Your, your spraying has to be so exact that it's very easy to kill switchgrass or injure it, injure old or kill new switchgrass. And so be careful on that. It's always better to use mowing uh, to uh, to uh, suppress weed competition, and uh, that's a safe way to do it if you've established switchgrass and you have weeds. But the number one switchgrass fail, dropping down to number five here, is a lack of sunlight. 
when you have competition for switchgrass, whether it's weeds, taller forms of switchgrass, other forms of grass that shades out the switchgrass and eventually kills it. Just like adding switchgrass to Egyptian wheat or screening. It's easy to do and that's what happens most of the time. There's been a lack of preparation for the switchgrass to remove weed competition and allow enough sunlight to hit that switch and for it to become established. And then the cool thing is once switchgrass is established, it'll all compete and shade out just about everything else. So once it's established well, you can just let it go. I encourage switchgrass to be planted in areas that have already been chemically controlled, ag fields, food plots. Frost seeding is a great way to do it because you can get great seed to soil contact. And then that seed is viable. It's gone through the stratification process so that it'll grow and germinate once soil temperatures hit mid 50s, high 50s, somewhere around there. About the same time corn's germinating, it'll take off, but you have to control weeds. So if you're planting it on already controlled, frost seeding on already controlled ground, you still hit it with simazine, three quarts per acre before spring green up and the ground is pliable, it can soak in that, that chemical, but there's no green showing yet. So there's a, a little window there that you can do that. Simazine stays in the ground for quite a while and it won't hurt the switchgrass. But you wanna be careful, three quarts per acre, not 20 quarts. I had a client plant use 20 quarts last year and that sets the seeds way back and uh, keeps them from growing. You wanna be very careful on how much you apply, how much simazine you use. Then after spring green up, you're still gonna have a portion of the weeds that live. I use two quarts per acre glyphosate, one pint per acre of 2,4-D. And between applying switchgrass and already chemically controlled ground, switch, uh, frost seeding is a great way to do it. Using simazine as a pre-emergent and then using a combination of 2,4-D and Roundup as a post-emergent, that'd be weeks before it's still gonna germinate. Then you've had three forms of effective weed control and you're giving your switchgrass a fighting chance against weeds and shade competition. Fast forward to the next spring. So if you're doing this in 2021, fast forward to 2022, you can still use simazine before spring green up and then let it go. You can always mow in July this first year if there's weed competition, you can mow in May, June, July next year. Um, depending on if you're up north, maybe more like June, July, August. If you're down south a little bit, May, June, July. But you can mow three times to mow weeds down to the level of the, of the switchgrass, allow sunlight to hit the switchgrass, become established. And you kind of think about it, switchgrass, a lot of times here in the upper Midwest, it might be just three or four inches high by the end of June, because it's not germinating until early June, end of May. And then end of, July, end of July, it might be seven, eight inches, 10 inches. And then what's really cool is by the end of August, it might be 40 inches high, you know, right up in this range right here and it has exponential growth. And think about that the following spring, after spring green up takes place, during spring, spring green up, that switch is growing at that exponential pace. So it has that root system established, it's ready to grow, ready to take off. And that's why when you establish it well the first year, it takes off so fast the second year, it avoids any type of weeds that might shade it out. And usually if it's established well that first year, it's just gonna take right off the second. And I've even seen where it's weak that first year that still establishes strong that second year, especially if you use simazine and if you mow, it can be established even better if there's weeds in there. So pretty easy to avoid a lot of this by just simply planning ahead and looking at it. how am I gonna get enough sunlight onto the switchgrass? You have to get good seed to soil contact. And that kind of leads me over here. Three favorite ways to plant switch. Frost heating, broadcasting, and drilling. I've used all three. And I can honestly say that I like frost seeding the most because if you have open ground, pretty easy to establish that. Switchgrass borders, ag land, there's a lot of ways you can establish switchgrass right off the bat very easily with minimal equipment. Drilling can be very effective, but it's also very expensive. And a lot of times, depending on your ground, you may not be able to get in there early spring because it's still muddy and wet at a time when you really want to catch those spring rains. A lot of times you're planting after that. And if you're practicing effective weed control, you might not have a lot of ground cover, so you're driving around in the mud, you have to wait till it dries out. So you're losing a month of growth a lot of times on that front side with switchgrass when you're drilling, not all the time. And then broadcasting. Last year, part of my switchgrass here ended up being the best stand. We got into early June, we bought the property on June 5th, somewhere in mid-June. We had open ground because of a previous food plot and had already sprayed it three times. So had three springs on it, 
Um, I wanted to convert that old food plot to switchgrass. I put heavy switchgrass on the ground and then I smashed it in with the tires from the Kubota, Packer Max, smashed it all down, got great seed to soil contact and then we were blessed with a lot of rain over the next week to 10 days. If that seed just lays there, dries out, not necessarily a good stand is going to be established. You might not have any stand at all, but when, it ha when you have lots of rain coming, you get on open soil, we ended up having a great stand back there that's between three feet and four feet tall, and it worked out really well. So favorite way to plant, kind of let your conditions tell you what's best to plant. If you have heavy, heavy thatch and weeds, if you can get a hold of a drill, that might be the way to go. If you have open ground and you're starting late, there's still ways to establish it. And of course, frost seeding is a way to plant ahead, get this done over the winter time. I encourage you, and I've just seen this with experience, I encourage you to frost seed when there's no snow. Just a little snow is okay, but when you have that crust of ice and a fast melt, all your seed can end up over the side if you're planting in hills and elevation changes like we are here, have a lot of topography to deal with, then you could have a lot of spring runoff. And, and certainly even in flat land areas, if that seed's sitting on ice and you get a quick melt and it drains away, you can really push your seed around to unwanted locations and really thick coverage over here, nothing over here. So um, when frosting, I encourage you to have that soil opened and we get those melts during the middle of the year. Uh, wait till everything's melting and thawing in the spring and you have open soil, throw it on there. You'll still get plenty of frost and freeze to and, and moisture to go through that stratification process. But again, number one switchgrass fail, really try to avoid weeds in your fields and competition, whether it's competition by other grasses within a mix or broad leaves. Switchgrass can't tolerate competition when it's young. It outcompetes almost everything when it's old, but you have to plan ahead with your switchgrass. There's no reason to fail this year. And switchgrass is a pretty surefire planting if you follow the right steps and the rules of getting exposed to sun and giving it that open canopy that it needs to survive, prosper, and outcompete everything else in the future. Now, as we transition into habitat season, I hope you've had a chance to check out my web class, How to Design Your, your Whitetail Parcel. It's on my website, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. I have a link in the description, and I hope you can find it, check it out, and enjoy it this year.